This talk is the second talk regarding EEG artifacts. It is intended for the Clinical Neurophysiology Fellows at Niklaus Children's Hospital. It will be conducted in a question and answer format. First question, the tip of the tongue is positive, A true, B false. In the first part of this series on artifacts, I presented this figure to you. In it, you find three structures with direct current potentials that frequently causes EEG artifacts. The tongue, like the eyeball and the heart, has a DC potential. The tip of the tongue is negative in relation to the root of the tongue. I tried to find out how much was the difference in potential between the tip and the root of the tongue, but I was not able to find it. But in the process of looking for this number, I found a discrepancy about the value of DC potential for the eyes. In Ebersol, the potential is given in millivolts, whereas in another book, Continuous EG Monitoring, it is given in microvolts. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Glossal kinetic artifacts can occur as A. Isolated artifacts B. Periodic artifacts C. Continuous artifacts D. All of the above. This is an example of isolated glossokinetic artifact. This is an example of periodic glossokinetic artifacts. And this is an example of continuous glossokinetic artifact. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which of the following is not true regarding isolated glossokinetic artifacts? A, an anterior to posterior decrementing gradient is consistent with glossokinetic artifacts. C, central derivations amplitude usually are higher than temporal ones. C, PC is most quiet electrode. D, all of the above. This frame shows an isolated glossokinetic artifact. The green square are surrounding the temporal derivations and the yellow squares are surrounding the central derivations. The waves, especially the initial wave in the cluster may be taller in the prefrontal to frontal derivation than in the frontal to temporal derivation. But after the initial wave, the frontotemporal derivation records larger waves than the prefrontal frontal derivations. Glossokinetic artifacts often combine muscle artifact and movement artifacts. In this frame, I have shaded the electrodes chains running through the temporal region. And here, using yellow, I have shaded the central region. Muscle artifact is, as expected, less prominent in the central region. The artifact is still appreciated in the FC to CC derivation and less prominent but is still present in the CC PC derivation. But it is greatly enhanced by placing an electrode on the sheen. Here the electrode is labeled neck and it is referred to PC which usually is the quietest electrode. The increase in artifact when the electrode is in the neck indicates that the source is likely to be the tongue. So the answer to this question is B. 
Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding periodic glossokinetic artifacts? A. Have no spastal evolution. B. Can be confused with periodic discharges. C. Have superimposed muscle artifacts in the temporal region. D. They have a logical temporal evolution. Periodic glossokinetic artifacts or potentials can be confused with periodic discharges of the type that occur in encephalopathy or with other types of artifacts. Distinction based on EEG criteria alone is at times difficult. The following points that I will give in the next few minutes may be helpful. Periodic glossokinetic artifacts do not have a spatial evolution or a logical time evolution. The central chain show minimal muscle artifacts when compared with temporal derivations. If you have any questions or doubts, read the technician comments, watch the video of the patient, or if you can, look at the patient. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following parameter is best to distinguish continuous glossokinetic artifact from epileptic ictal activity? A. Field. B. Amplitude evolution. C. Spatial evolution. D. Frequency evolution. In the presence of any EEG activity suspected of an ictal epileptiform event, it is often helpful to follow a set of steps to determine its nature. This is the example of glossokinetic artifact that I have shown you before. Let's just say that we do not know the nature of this activity and that we are considering the possibility that this activity represents an epileptic ictal event. With onset at FP1, F7 derivation, and at FP2, F8 derivations, that then spreads to the temporal regions. The first step I take when determining if an activity is artifactual or a seizure is to map the field. I like to start by selecting a time period usually corresponding to a single well-defined wave at the beginning or close to the beginning of the episode. I have done so in this frame by introducing a green rectangle and then enlarging it and labeling it as you can see in this frame. Next, I select from the derivation the best looking wave. In this case, I have chosen the most anterior one, which I have surrounded by a magenta rectangle and I will further enlarge it. As you can see in this frame, I have done so. I have done so to determine its polarity. The polarity of this wave is negative at FP1 in relation to being positive at F7. Now I do the same in the right hemisphere at the same time period. I will go through the same enlarging and labeling process as I have done in the past. I will also select the wave and enhance it. As you can see, the polarity of the wave is negative at FP2 in relation to F8. Displaying these fields in the in a 1020 system model, we can see that they suggest a positive field in the left hemisphere in the prefrontal region, here represented in red, and a negative field in the right hemisphere prefrontal region, here represented in blue. We come to realize that the diagnosis of epileptic form activity is very unlikely based on the field distribution because unlike epileptic form activity in which we usually have a single field, here we are seeing two fields. So we put one in the not seizure column since very few events 
as we have just previously mentioned from the cerebral origin will have a horizontal dipole and those that do have a horizontal dipole have a very different appearance. But still we will consider the possibility that this activity is seizures and therefore we will go on to the second step. In the second step we determine the evolution of the shape of the individual waves which within the rhythm, rhythmic activity. The individual waves of an ictal epileptiform rhythm for the most part maintain their shape and when they change their shape these changes are rather small and gradual. As you can see initially in the event the waves of which I am signaling one out are triangular. Further along the run a wave look notch. In addition, it is wider than the prior selected wave, but still the shape of the original wave is somewhat not greatly distorted. The third wave I have chosen is again triangular, and as you can see, the evolution of the shape of the single wave within the rhythm is minimal and gradual, thus cons consistent with an epileptic seizure. So, a yes for the seizure column. The third step is to determine the evolution of, of the duration of the individual wave within the rhythmic activity. The individual wave in an ictal epileptiform rhythm usually increases gradually as time goes by. And as you can see in this frame, this is what happens in this activity. Thus, it is consistent with epileptic, with an epileptic seizure. So we put another check for the seizure column. Now we will have more doubts as to the nature of this activity, whether there is an artifact or a seizure. So we take a fourth step. This step consists of determining the evolution of the amplitude of the individual wave within the rhythmic activity. The individual wave of an ictal epileptiform rhythm usually increases gradually as time goes by and then decreases. And as you can see, this is what happens here, at least the increasing part, thus it is consistent with an epileptic seizure. So we put another check mark on the seizure column. And move on to the fifth step. This step consists of determining the spatial evolution of the rhythmic activity as a whole. Often seizure activity that starts in one derivation spreads to contiguous derivation orderly, reflecting a geographical spread, whereas the spread of artifact characteristics jump derivations as it goes from one side to the other or from one region to the other. I have shaded red the spatial evolution of the activity in the left hemisphere and in the right hemisphere. This spatial evolution fits with the diagnosis of a seizure. So we place another check mark in the seizure column. And move on to the sixth step. This step consists of determining the temporal evolution of the rhythmic activity. It is done by considering the inter-discharge interval, not the peak-to-peak -peak distance. In this case, there is no interval between waves, as you can see, pointed by this arrow. Again here, and here. This does not go with, epilept with an epileptic event. So, we put a check mark for the no seizure column. The seventh step consists of clinically observing the patient or observing a video of the patient during the actual event. And in this case, we saw during observation that the lateral tongue was moving. 
So this check mark goes for no seizure column. So why, despite more check marks in the seizure column than in the no seizure column, we still think that this is not a seizure but a, but a glossokinetic artifact. This is because some parameters are more reliable indicator of the nature of an EEG activity than others. And as a whole, fields and clinical observation are by far more reliable, in my opinion, when we're faced with the possibility of uh, a glossokinetic artifact or a seizure. So this epoch, despite that numerically there are more check marks in the seizure column than in the no seizure column, we do not label it as a seizure because the relative value of the field distribution and observation in this case outweighs other parameters. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, which of the following methods can be used to avoid confusing glossokinetic artifact with seizure activity? A, covering the tongue with a glove. B, compare with previously induced tongue movements. C, add electrodes. D, all of the above. Different things can be done to avoid confusing a glossokinetic artifact with a seizure. One thing is to have the patient move his tongue at the beginning of the EE recording. This is usually done by asking the patient to repeat certain words and seeing the impact in the recording. In this frame, the artifact produced by repeating certain words are shown. Another thing that we can do is to add electrodes. Usually PC is putting the G2 spot of the amplifier because it is the quietest. If the questionable activity is asymmetrical, then electrode 1 can be placed in the right or the left cheek. If the questionable activity is symmetrical, then the electrodes in lead 1 can be placed in the submental region or in the neck just below it. An alternative way is to use left and right cheek at E1 and a submental electrode at E2, regardless if the artifact is symmetrical or asymmetrical. This frame shows the impact of repeating la 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 on the usual 1020 derivation. PC, as I just mentioned, is the quietest electrode in most instances, as you can see in this frame. On the second panel, on your right, you can see the impact of la 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 using many different electrodes placed in combination around the mouth. Finally, I'd like to show you this technique. It is called the gloved tongue. It can be used to eliminate glossokinetic artifacts, or at least to decrease them significantly. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and choose the best answer. The artifact produced by the similar metal coming in contact with each other is a very sharp spike. This artifact is most frequent in the temporal region, but is often diffuse. The similar metal artifacts resemble in shape electrode artifacts, but the distribution, as I just previously mentioned, is quite different because they involve more than one electrode. The cause of this artifact is obviously the similar metal used for filling teeth. And they go away by keeping the mouth open because they only happen when the metals are in contact with each other. So the answer to this question is C. 
Next question, which of the following artifacts is not the result of cardiac contraction? A, pulse artifact, B, bioelectrical cardiac artifact, C, ballocardiographic artifacts, D, electromagnetographic artifacts. The heart produces bioelectrical cardiac artifacts, pulse artifacts, and ballistocardiographic artifacts. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, which is the most prominent wave represented in bioelectrical cardiac artifacts? A, Q wave, B, P waves, C, R waves, D, Z waves. R wave is the most common wave represented in bioelectrical cardiac artifacts. The potential vector created by R wave is positive in the left side. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Most of the time cardiac bioelectric artifacts are most prominent at a, F3, B, T5, C, T4, D, P, Z. Most prominent EKG artifacts are usually present in the left temporal region, that is, at T5, where they are positive. This is represented in this frame. As you can see, T5 is strongly positive and T6 is negative in relation to A1. In this new frame, you can see that A1 is positive and A2 is almost free of artifact. But at times, A1 is positive, but in addition, A2 is clearly negative as it is in this frame. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The shape of the heart artifact does not change over time. A true, B false. The shape of the heart artifact that is present at one moment may change significantly the next time. This is so because body movement and breathing movements change the relation between the heart and the head, thus changing the configuration of the heart artifact. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following is likely to produce an EEG free of EKG artifacts? A. Turning the head to the left. B. Combining chest and neck electrodes at E2. C. Combining right ear and left ear electrodes as reference. D. Using left ear as common reference. On the first half of this epoch, when the left side of the head is resting over the mattress, you can see prominent EKG artifact. In the second half of the epoch, after the head is turned midline, the EKG artifact is greatly reduced. In addition to physically turning the head, in the presence of cardiac artifacts, several steps can be taken to decrease them. Here I am representing a derivation going from O2 to M1 to use as the baseline to judge other derivations. In the next few frames, I will represent what happens by changing to the different derivations. One of these cardiac artifact reducing montage is to combine the right and the left ear or the right and the left mastoid and to enter them through the electrode E2 on the amplifier while keeping O1 at the entry of electrode 1 of the amplifier. 
Another possibility is changing the reference to acquired electrode. In this frame, I have chosen T4 because uh, it's usually one of the quietest electrodes for cardiac artifacts. And as you can see, the cartoon depicts a smaller cardiac artifact than we initially had. But by far, the best way to produce cardiac artifact is to combine a posterior neck electrode in a sternal notch electrode and connecting them using a T-connector to the E2 slot of the amplifier. This combination of electrode coming through E2 greatly reduces cardiac artifact. And as I have just mentioned, it is said to be the best method to decrease heart artifact. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and choose the preferred answer. Here, the activity pres present at P402 derivation, shaded in green, certainly has the shape of an EKG artifact, but it is unusual that it is only captured on the right side and posteriorly. It is also unusual that at times a different artifact is present, shaded in magenta in this frame. As you can see, it does not keep relation with the larger artifact. These artifacts resulted from mother's face resting against O2. Thus, the P4 O2 derivation is capturing the child heart artifact that is consistent and faster, and the mother heart artifact that is inconsistent and slower. So, the answer to this question is false. Next question, which of the following is not true regarding pacemaker artifact? A, high frequency polyphasic potential, B, maximal at A1, minimal at A2, C, brief, D, in line with EKG pacemaker discharge. Pacemaker artifacts are polyphasic, very brief, maximal at A1 and A2, but they may be diffuse. Their origin can be traced back to the heart channel. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding pulse wave artifacts? A. Pulse changes electrode scalp contact. B. Anterior more frequent than posterior scalp. C. Constant about 200 to 300 milliseconds after QRS. D. Stops by changing electrodes. In addition to bioelectrical cardiac artifacts. The heart also produces pulse artifacts. Pulse artifacts occur when an electrode is placed over the surface of an artery. They are more prominent when the electrode is loosely applied to the scalp. The way to resolve the presence of pulse artifact is by removing the electrode from top of the artery to a place with no pulse. This is a drawing of the scalp arteries. As you can see, arteries are in the back of the head, in the middle of the head, 
and in the front. Yet, Paul's artifacts are more often present in the anterior part of the scalp than in the posterior region of the scalp. Paul's artifacts are usually confined to a single electrode and appear as a slow wave about 200 to 300 milliseconds after the QRS cardiac artifact. This is about the time the blood from the heart takes to get to the scalp arteries. Notice in this frame the normal brain activity overriding the pulse artifact and that an electrode artifact represented by the white out phase derivation at C3 is present, thus indicating that the electrode is loosely applied and therefore more vulnerable to pulse artifact. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding ballistocardiographic artifacts? A. Head and body movements triggered by heart contraction. B. Morphologically similar to pulse artifact but usually more widespread. C. More prominently anterior. D. Maybe generalized. The third type of cardiac artifact is called ballistocardiographic artifact. These artifacts have certain characteristics. Their frequency is in the delta range but have a peculiar quality of going in pace by pace with a heart rate. Most of the time, multiple electrodes in the back of the head are involved. This is likely related to head movements and pillow movements. The artifacts are produced by head and body movements, and they are likely due to pulsation of the aorta as a consequence of cardiac contraction and the closeness to the heart. The artifact improves by using a roll towel beneath the head, thus removing the head from the pillow. This is an example of a ballistocardiographic EEG artifact. As you can see, it is more prominent in the occipital electrodes, but it spreads forward. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Muscle artifacts are classified according to A. Density B. Location C. Periodicity D. All of the above. Contraction of a single muscle fiber produces a very sharp wave, ranging from 10 to 20 milliseconds. Muscle artifacts are classified according to their density, location, which at times is given as head and limb artifacts, and at times as a specific muscle artifacts. In addition to density and location, periodicity is another parameter used to classify muscle artifacts. I will start talking about density as a parameter to classify muscle artifacts. Muscle artifacts may appear as a single discharge each arising independently from the baseline, as you can see in this frame. 
they may also arrive, arise as picket fence artifacts when the baseline can be recognized by multiple motor units punched together. They can also be classified as partial interference pattern when the baseline can be recognized only for short intervals as complete interference, interference pattern when the baseline cannot be recognized at all but individual muscle fibers contraction can be identified away from the baseline and as full interference pattern when baseline is obliterated and individual fibers cannot be identified neither at the baseline or further from the baseline. Another way of classifying muscle artifact is according to their location. As we previously mentioned, we talk about limb movement contraction artifacts or head muscle contraction artifacts. Among the head muscles artifact, the most frequent muscles that produce artifact are the frontalis and the temporalis. Muscle artifacts can also be classified according to a third modality, which is their periodicity. This is an example of continuous muscle artifact of different densities. This is an example of periodic muscle artifact. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Muscle artifact provoked by photic stimulation only involve the anterior facial muscles. A true, B false. This is an example of photomyoclonic artifact. Photomyoclonic artifact occurs about 50 milliseconds after the stroke of flash. They may coincide with the occipital driving response although that response is not present in this frame. Muscle contraction occurs primarily in the frontal region, unilateral as, as is seen in this frame at times, but may also occur in the occipital muscle. Muscle contraction are usually negative, and although in this frame we have presented unilateral contraction, most of the time they tend to be bilateral. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following is not consistent with eyelid fluttering? A. Alpha frequency. B. Disappearance with voluntary or forced eye closure. C. Disappearance with voluntary or forced eye opening. D. None of the above. Eyelid fluttering may occur triggered by photic stimulation, as in this frame. When it is so, the fluttering frequency usually coincides with the frequency of the photic stimulation. But fluttering may also occur independently of photic stimulation, as you can see in this frame, and in such cases it could be in the delta range, in the theta range, or rarely in the alpha range. Voluntarily or force eye opening eliminates fluttering, as does voluntarily or forcefully closing the patient's eye. The arrow in this case indicates the time of closure. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Rhythmic sharp waves that are maximal at CZ or BC are often found in A. Facial myokemia, B. Facial synkinesia, C. Palatal myoclonus, D. Facial tics. 
facial myokemia consists of unilateral short burst of 3 to 7 Hz myogenic activity occurring with clear-cut periodicity during a wake and a sleep. It is usually an activity that involves the frontalis or the temporalis muscles. But at times, facial myokemia may involve the vestigial auricularis muscle. In such cases, ED evidence of myokemia may occur with no apparent clinical movements. This frame shows continuous muscle activity arising from the F3 electrode. It represents left facial synkinesia following eye closure. Facial synkinesia is usually due to aberrant muscle reinnervation following peripheral facial nerve lesion, but they can also occur with hyper excitability of the facial nucleus. This is an example of palatal myoclonus. It is best seen using ear to ear derivations or using an ear as a reference. This epoch shows several interesting features of palatal myoclonus. Among these features are their presence in the ear to ear derivation, their regular occurrence at 60 to 100 beats per minute. But its most interesting feature is their association with rhythmic midline sharp waves and the fact that these sharp waves are cerebral evoked potentials. This is another example of palatal myoclonus. Notice the presence of palatal myoclonus in A1, A2 channel, but their absence in the T5 to T6 derivations. Also notice that it is not present using ipsilateral temporal or ear derivations. That is, using short ipsilateral temporal ear derivations. In this frame, the area pointed by the arrow indicates the position of the palate. I place a wiggly line to indicate myoclonus. In this new frame, I have superimposed the dental rubro olivary tract that is what is also known as the Gillian molaret triangle. Take a few seconds to look at the components of this track. I have labeled them color matching the structures. Typically, in patients with palatal myoclonus, the inferior olive is hypertrophic. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Please take a look at this frame and choose the best answer. A. Bruxism. B. Facial tick. C. Sucking. D. Shin tremor. This pattern is characteristic of bruxism. Notice the alternating appearance of the muscle contraction. It has been labeled a checkerboard appearance. Bruxism usually involves the masseters and the temporalis muscles. Swallowing artifact presented in this frame may produce symmetrical or, as in this case, asymmetrical temporal artifact that lack the rhythmicity of bruxism. Sucking produces a complex morphologic morphological artifact associated with sucking and head movement. It may be periodic but does not have the alternating and rhythmic quality of bruxism. As you can see, sucking not only involves the cephalic derivation but it also involves non-cephalic derivations. In this case we're seeing the uh, sucking artifact at the level of the eyes and also in the chin EMG. This epoch was captured in a patient with facial tics. It resembles a spike and waves, but muscle is very much superimposed on it. And that is usually allows the distinction between a spike and wave and this type of activity. 
uh, it's very interesting in this frame uh, to the channel that I'm pointing by the ar arrow. I do not feel this is a, a misprint. I think that is there to show that increased distance between electrodes increases the amplitude of the waveform at least up to about 10 centimeters apart. After that, it decreases it. This epoch corresponds to chin muscle twitches. As you can see in this case, it is restricted to the right side. So the answer to this question is A. Next question, head and limb movements artifact always involve multiple channels, A true, B false. Body and head artifacts usually involve multiple channels creating an illogical feel. But at times a single channel is primarily involved as you can see in this frame. And at times also the involvement of one channel is intermittent and very discreet as you can see in this frame. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. Which of the following artifact is mediated by the central sympathetic nervous system? A. Perspiration artifact. D. Sweat gland artifact. C. Salt breaches. D. Galvanic skin artifact. Traditionally, three types of skin-related artifacts have been lumped together. They are perspiration, galvanic skin response, and salt breaches artifacts. Perspiration artifacts produce very slow waves that in this epoch can be seen involving the brain and eye electrodes. They result from alteration in the electrode contact inter and the interaction between the different sweat constituents and sweat gland potentials. At times, normal brain activity can be seen overriding the slow waves. Salt breaches artifacts produce a flat or almost flat line. You can see such artifacts present at the FP1, FPC channel in this frame. Salt bridges artifact occurred because both the E1 and E2 of the same amplifier are being presented with the same data. That is the reason the term salt bridges are often used to describe this artifact, because there is a bridge between the two electrodes. The third type of a skin artifact is the galvanic skin artifact, which is also called sympathetic skin response. This epoch represents a sympathetic skin response. That, as you know, is also called galvanic skin artifact and also psychogalvanic skin artifact. At the scalp, the sympathetic skin response looks like a biphasic or at times triphasic wave, lasting about one to two seconds. This is the area that the artifact is usually picked up, which is usually diffusely. If we were to record at the same time from the palm of the hand, we will also see a consistent artifact. This artifact will consist of a triphasic response of alternating polarity lasting a little bit longer than two to three seconds. The skin reaction, regardless of the location that is detected, the scalp or the hand, is the response to sensory stimulation and as you can see in this frame, to clapping, or it can also be a response to any other type of emotional event. As you can see, it occurs first in the scalp, 
the magnet the magenta lines are there showing you the onset in the scalp and later in the arm the blue line are represent are indicating when it starts in the hand you can see that there is a difference of about half a second between the scalp and the hand initially occurring in the scalp and then in the hand the delay is because the, the response is mediated through a slow conducting on me on millinated cholinergic sympathetic fibers arising from the superior cervical ganglia and therefore it takes it, there is a shorter distance from there to the scalp than there is to the palm of the hand. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Perspiration artifact and a slow background activity should make you think of A. Hypothyroidism B. Hyponatremia C. Hypoglycemia D. All of the above. Sweating is a sign of hypoglycemia, as you will know, and delta wave reflects cerebral hypometabolism. Their combination should make you think of hypoglycemia. So the answer to this question is C. Next question, please. Look at this frame and choose the best answer. Electrical fields are all around. Here, EEG electrodes are connected to a yellow chip brain. This is the tracing from that experiment. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Electrode artifacts can be due to problems related to A. Capacitance B. Impedance C. Photon Chemical Reaction D. All of the above We have so far talked about artifact arising from the eyes where we have included artifacts generated by the eyeball artifact generated by eyelid muscles and artifact generated by lateral rectus muscle Glossokinetic artifacts that include tone movements and the similar metal, metal artifacts. Cardiac artifacts during which we included hard bioelectrical artifacts, pulse artifact, ballistocardiac artifacts, and pacemaker artifacts. We also have talked about muscle artifact and we have talked about those that are in the limb and in the head. And we have also talked about skin artifacts among which we have included perspiration, salt bridge and galvanic artifacts. The reason I am mentioning this at this point is to highlight the arbitrary nature of our classification of artifacts. For example, when talking about heart we include cardiac, pulse, ballistocardiographic, and pacemaker artifacts. The classification will become even more arbitrary from the rest of this talk, as you will see. I will start talking about electrodes. An input board. Electrodes have three components metal disc, lead wire, and connector plug. The connector plug is a female type. The connector is placed in the input board slot and then a cable carries the information to the solid region of the EEG machine towards and to the derivation selector mo uh, module. The classification 
I like to use is one that I put together from multiple sources in an attempt to create an organized way for me to remember the different types of artifacts that are directly related to the electrode. The first four division of electrodes artifacts relate to the alleged mechanism involved in the genesis of the artifact. Capacitance, impedance, photons, and electrode placement. This distinction is arbitrary since multiple mechanisms may be involved in the genesis of an electrode artifact. and other solid component of the machine may contribute to what appears to be a purely electrode artifact. So we start this classification with missed electrode placement. This refers to putting the electrode from one scalp region into a slot in the head box belonging to a different scalp region. Here you can see on your left the result of putting the O1 scalp electrode in the FC slot in the head box. On the right, the situation is corrected. Another factor producing electro artifacts is capacitance. Capacitance discharge is the cause of electrode pop. Another factor is the exposure of metal of the electrode to photons, which would create a photoelectric artifact. By far, the most frequent cause of electrode artifacts are impedance issues. Impedance problems can cause artifact in a number of ways. Decreased impedance taken to extreme will lead to perspiration artifacts which result from alteration in electrode skin contact, interaction among different sweat constituents and sweat gland potentials. Also, decreasing pinnings will produce salt breaches. As you can recall, perspiration tends to produce artifacts with high amplitude, low frequency, and involving more than one channel. Whereas salt breaches produce low amplitude artifacts, almost straight line artifact, and usually involve one channel. Another problem related to impedance is increased impedance. Increased impedance produces faulty low or high amplitude and loss of low frequency activity. Increased impedance also makes electrodes more vulnerable to photoelectric artifacts. Mismatch electrode impedance, that is a pair of electrodes impedance that are more than 20% different, makes it more likely that the common rejection mode of the amplifier be overwhelmed, thus making the machine more vulnerable to instrumental artifacts. I am using the term instrumental artifact to refer to those produced by the solid components of the EG machine, but it also makes it more vulnerable to environmental artifacts, especially to 60 hertz activity. When the impedance of an electrode skin interface is not stable, periods of high, low, and normal impedance alternate randomly in each electrode pair. This produces multiple artifacts due to increase, decrease, and at times mismatch impedance. Unstable impedance can be due to electrode skin contact problems or that despite good or relative good contact, excessive forces are applied 
to the interface leading to electrode skin stress. On a stable, electrodes produce artifacts consistent with increased, decreased, mismatch electrode impedance, as I previously mentioned. So the answer to this question is all of the above. Next question. Electrode high impedance in an EAT electrode may lead to all of the following except A. Photovoltaic or photoelectric artifacts B. Falsely low amplitude C. Falsely high amplitude D. Loss of high frequency components If a wave at the scalp is the product of a slow and fast component waves at the level of the cortex, when the impedance is low, the scalp recorded wave will display the, the EEG wave produced at the cortex faithfully. So the, there will be a faithful reproduction of the activity generated at the brain. On the other hand, if the impedance is high, there will be a loss of low frequency components. So the monitor will show an activity that is different from the one it would have been recorded if the impedance would have been low and certainly different than what it would have gathered if the electrodes were at the level of the cortex. I am going back to the original drawing, the one with the normal impedance, to show you the effect of high impedance upon amplitude. The one that I showed you before was the effect of high impedance upon wave components. So going back to the effect of high impedance upon amplitude, you can see that increase impedance decreases the amplitude of, of the activity displayed at the monitor, or it may increase the amplitude of the, of the waves. Increase impedance also as we just mentioned, make electrodes more vulnerable to produce photoelectric artifacts. As you can see in this frame, this artifact is likely to be the consequence of an increase in impedance on the TC, T6 electrode. Another consequence of increase in impedance is that if it can, that it can lead to ground electrode going into the amplifier to become the de facto E1 electrode. This situation is often referred to as ground electrode to regular electrode inversion. This frame shows an example. Here, as pointed out by the aqua arrow, eye movements are present in O1 but inverted. This is so because since O1 has very high impedance, and the ground is FPZ that has less impedance, the amplifier disregards O1 input and uses FPC for calculations. This is very unlikely to happen in digital EEGs because the, mo the mode of data acquisition is different, but theoretically can it still happen. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, a fault involving an electrode or the electrode skin interface under one electrode may lead to 60 Hertz artifact, A true, B false. In the USA, anywhere there is alternating electricity, there will be 60 Hertz activity. 60 Hertz artifact is the product of a failure of the common rejection mode to eliminate similar activity entering the amplifier through E1 and E2. This is more likely to occur the more electrical equipment are around the EEG machine 
and if the impedance discrepancy between the paired electrode is high. In an environment with excessive 60 Hz, relatively minor mismatches in impedance between pair electrodes will generate 60 Hz artifacts. As well as in an environment with relatively little 60 Hz activity but high percentage of mismatch impedance. So one way we can reduce 60 Hz artifact is to keep the overall impedance at 5000 ohms, thus preventing high percentage of mismatch. Obviously, another way of eliminating 60 Hz artifact is to disconnect all unnecessary electrical equipment. Other step consists of looking at the electrode. In this frame, you can see what happens when all goes well. The cerebral activity is faithfully reproduced. I have added in the bottom what it appears if there is loss of electrode scalp connection, that is 60 Hz are artifacts, a broken pin, a broken head box receptacle, a broken wire in the cable going from the head box to the machine. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. The result of high impedance is A. 60 Hz artifact B. Fictitious gain of amplitude C. Loss of low frequency D. All of the above The reason that high impedance leads to 60 Hz artifact is because of the likelihood of mismatch is increased when impedance is high. As depicted in this frame, in the presence of large amount of 60 Hz activity, even when low impedance is present, the C stands for impedance, 60 Hz activity or artifact will appear. 60 Hz artifact will also appear when the amount of 60 Hz activity is low, but the mismatch between the electrodes is high. So the best way to control impedance is either, as we previously mentioned, eliminating equipment that produces 60 Hz activity and decreasing the impedance in all the electrodes to avoid mismatch. So the answer to this question is D. Please look at this frame and choose the best answer. This epoch has a very important detail. The ground was placed in the right mastoid. Also notice that the eye movement on the left is in the opposite direction than the eye movement on the right. But that the eye artifact at F3, C3 derivations and F4, C4 derivations are in the same direction. Also notice that the FP1, F3 derivation shows alpha activity but the FP2, F4 derivation shows bad activity. This has occurred as a result of FP1 being disconnected from the headbox and the machine amplifier using the ground as if it be the electrode being connected to the E1 of the amplifier. Remember, this occurrence is very unlikely to occur now that we use digital machines because the connection is not made between FP1 and F3. In the digital machines, all connections are made from each scalp electrode to a reference, and then mathematically 
the different electrodes are compared. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, which of the following is the key feature of ocular artifact that distinguishes it from perspiration artifact? A. Regular rhythmicity B. Phase reversal C. Bifrontal fields D. All of the above Perspiration makes the baseline wander illogically. Eye movement causes logical fluctuations in the prefrontal frontal derivations. So the answer to this question is D. With this question, I'm going to end the second part in this three-part series on EEG artifacts. Thank you very much.